Credits, culture, industry, trade. This is Sins of a Solar Empire 2. The exploit aspect of Forex gaming generally concerns the construction of industrial and economic infrastructure and acquisition of resources. These resources are then dedicated towards further industrial and technological development, building and fielding a military, diplomatic dealings and funding espionage. Typically, it is these resources and their relative scarcity across the game map that drives much of the diplomatic and military gameplay in a Forex. Sins of a Solar Empire 2 is no exception. Most gravity wells you control will generate resources for you to exploit, with different planet types offering different resource distributions. In Sins 2, when playing as the traders or the advent, credits are generated by developing the commercial assets of each colony you own, and unlike Sins of a Solar Empire Rebellion, this income is not tied to a population level. In Rebellion, credits were increased indirectly by increasing population size through civilian infrastructure. Now, each level purchased in the Commerce Planetary Development track directly sets the rate at which you accumulate credits on that world, with various technologies and planet items available to increase this. Different planet types have different rates of credit accumulation, and this new system gives you more options for fine-tuning your empire's economy. The Vasari are initially more interested in metal and crystal than the other two races, and do not generate any money from their colonies in the early stages of the game. We'll cover how they interact with credits in a future episode. In Sins of a Solar Empire Rebellion, Metal and crystal were mined exclusively from asteroids orbiting the main body in a gravity well, and required the construction of orbital extractors to get these important strategic resources. These mining operations were constructed independent of the orbital structure limit, so manually building them was a no-brainer choice and extra busy work for the player. In Sins 2, most planets will hold some metal or crystal resources for you to mine out in simple fashion by purchasing upgrades to the mining planetary development track, with higher levels accessing a faster rate of extraction. Different planet types contain different resources, and some will have both metal and crystal. It's important to stress that in Sins of a Solar Empire 2, your primary method of attaining metal and crystal is through this mining planetary track. However, there are still metal and crystal asteroids orbiting some gravity wells, and these can be optionally mined for even more resource production. But be aware, unlike in Sins Rebellion, these orbital extractors do count towards your logistics total and so tough choices will need to be made as to what you want to focus your empire on. As with credit generation, technologies are available for research to increase metal and crystal production rates for both on and off planet extraction, and planet items can affect both of these further. Sins of a Solar Empire 2 introduces a series of brand new resources called exotics, representing very rare and difficult to obtain materials that are used to access the most advanced technologies, the most powerful warships, and some very exciting planet, capital ship, and titan items. Exotics are manufactured in specialist orbital factories, and because of their great scarcity and the difficulty involved in their fabrication, they are slow and expensive to produce. There are five different exotics available in Sins 2, with the fifth material, Quornium, requiring very advanced technology to create. Manufacturing a lot of exotics quickly will require a significant investment in civilian infrastructure points, and you're going to have to make tough decisions as to whether you really want access to that higher technology hardware, or more trade ports, phase technology, faster culture output, more shipyards, and so on. Exotics are required for all the very best gear, and so they become an extremely valuable resource later in the game. These unusual substances can also be found by running a survey on a planet, becoming available for use in the early expansion phase of the game before the exotic producing orbital factories have been researched. This makes Survey a very attractive option. A trader faction with early access to Taurinite and Indurium could deploy an early coal battleship onto the map and dominate their neighbours with overwhelming firepower. Exotics found through surveys are a finite resource, and you'd be well advised to bring your standard exotic manufacturing facilities online before these supplies run out. Exotics can also be scavenged from the derelict husks lying in the shadowy regions of certain gravity wells. They'll be well guarded, but claiming them will be well worth the effort. Players can also reclaim exotics from the wrecks of destroyed enemy capital ships too, and an aggressive stance with your neighbours can be one way to increase your stocks of these valuable resources. If you're unable to dedicate the orbital infrastructure to exotics production, you can trade for it with the other empires in the game through diplomatic means. In Sins of a Solar Empire 2, 
we've provided the tools to fine tune your economy exactly the way you want it. Building your empire's industrial might to face the dynamic challenges of an ever evolving war. We've replaced the planetary specialization systems from Sin's Rebellion, which limited you to just three different types of colony specialization with the planet item system, which offers a large range of unlockable upgrades to customize your colonies however you need them. For example, it may be that your best natural credit generating colony is also the one most exposed to enemy invasion. Do you put all of your eggs in one basket by maximizing its credit output, piling on trade stations and then a whole lot of military orbital structures and planet item based defenses to protect your investment? This will be a very powerful credit generating asset, but it will also be a tantalizing target for enemy raids. And if you don't adequately defend it, you could lose most of your empire's wealth to a single well-executed military strike. Or do you diversify your economy and spread it wider by developing your more modest colonies with planet items such as the commercial district, orbital mining control, or the fulfillment warehouse? This kind of industrial diffusion is a lot more difficult to permanently damage, and your enemy will have to change their tactics if they want to do lasting harm to your economic development. However, when utilizing industrial dispersion of this kind, you'll not fully realize the potential you'd get by stacking economic modifiers on top of one or two very rich worlds, and you might be sacrificing your cultural and trade outputs in doing so. The traders are particularly adept at setting up this kind of distributed economy, and can make great use of their special ability to redistribute export points to match their ever-shifting economic needs even with a smaller territory than others. Furthermore, contact with the minor factions will unlock the metal, crystal and exotic markets. Metal and crystal can be bought and sold for credits, with the value of the trades varying according to the relative level of demand, but exotics may only be sold, although there can be other channels to procure them, such as the minor factions. Manufacturing and selling exotics can be extremely lucrative, however, and heavy investment into the productions of exotics can pay off in more ways than one. Remember, credits, metal, crystal and exotics are all available to trade through diplomatic channels with your rivals in the game and this opens up great opportunities for cunning economic power plays. Grab all the best crystal producing planets, defend them well, destroy the minor faction running the crystal market to justify even higher prices, and then sell your stockpiles on to needy neighbors for an extortionate rate. Demand resources as tribute for weaker empires in return for you not attacking them, granting you access to a steady supply of free goods in return for your continued protection. The way orbital structures and planetary development tracks work will be familiar if you've played Sins of a Solar Empire Rebellion, but we've made some significant changes here to make colony management easier and more fun. We've discussed how the planet item system has greatly expanded upon the player's agency when it comes to customizing your colony's various economic, industrial and military options. Replacing the old colony specialization and emergency facility upgrades from Sins Rebellion with many varied unlockable planet items. These are accessed via research, through winning auctions, procured from the minor factions in exchange for influence, and by surveying your colonies. Similarly, the way you upgrade the infrastructure of your colony has changed too. The new system of on-world mining can be upgraded here, while logistics and defense upgrade the maximum number of civilian and military orbital structures you can field around a gravity well respectively. Commerce increases credit income, while the new civilian research and military research will add stacking bonuses to their respective research fields. Military orbital structures are used to defend your worlds, while civilian orbital structures are varied and have many uses, such as spreading your culture, shipbuilding, trade and increasing the maximum tier of both civilian and military research that your scientists have access to. Each of the three races will have its own unique structures, with their own unique abilities to wield. Your empire's cultural dominance is simulated too, with culture working slightly differently to the way it did in Sin's Rebellion. Culture now has to fully dominate a gravity well before it can travel to adjacent planets, giving players a little more time to throw up their own culture-generating orbital structures and push back this subversive alien threat. We've also added a new concept called Culture Resistance, which is used to resist the infiltration of enemy culture but will not directly push your own back on them, and this is a key feature of xenophobic factions like the Tech Rebels. The invasion of a dominant culture belonging to another player into your colony will no longer cause you to lose control of it, nor does it prevent you from colonizing a neutral world either. However, spreading culture across your worlds will increase the production rate of influence, a valuable asset used to purchase favor from the various minor factions. There are other effects depending on the faction you're playing as. For example, after researching Xeno mining as the Vasari with your own culture dominating your colony, you'll receive an increased mining rate there. The Vasari can never have enough metal and crystal, and so this is a powerful effect that you'll want to quickly spread across the sector as soon as you can. Get building those Xeno Relations Centers. 
we'll take a look at the advantages that cultural dominance brings to the other factions when we shine a spotlight on their unique distinguishing mechanics later on in this series. The Trader Emergency Coalition, as the name would suggest, are masters of commerce. They alone of the three races in Sins 2 have access to the Trade Port, an orbital structure that allows them to further tweak their economic output according to the resources they have access to at any colony with one or more Trade Ports. Previously, in Sins of the Solar Empire Rebellion, Trade Ports applied a stacking credit bonus to a colony's output, which increased with the length of a trade route between Trade Ports in your Empire. In Sins of the Solar Empire 2, Trade Ports have a different effect. Each planet has a trade capacity which can be increased by building more Trade Ports, unlocking both export points and export types available for export. The export potential of each world is genuinely intuitive to the planet type. For example, volcanic worlds are bursting with metal, ice worlds are rich in crystal, while Terran planets often have a high goods value to represent its increased habitability. Export points can be allocated to goods, metal or crystal exports. Goods generate extra credits as before, but both metal and crystal accumulation rates can be increased too. Export points can be reassigned at will, an incredibly powerful ability that empowers their economy with great flexibility in adjusting to the ever-changing needs of the war. This handy tool gives the traders some interesting choices when it comes to planning their economy for the game ahead. Do you forego trade and instead focus on the mineral-rich asteroids dotted around the sector, building your orbital mining and aim for a high raw material output? Or do you pass on the asteroids completely and instead focus on trade ports, mining what you need from your colonies directly and then reassigning your export points to cover your needs as they arise? The choice, as always, is yours. The options you have to build your industrial and economic might have greatly increased in Sins of the Solar Empire 2, but what are you building all this industry for? We'll find out in the next episode where we take a look at the last of the four X's, Exterminate.